Hey everybody, it says we're live and um, want to welcome the panel back. There's Ed and Bobby and so far Skipper isn't here. We haven't heard that he won't be. Um, but our guest tonight is uh, Alex, uh, Alexander Williamson from The Secret History Inside your, In Your Aquarium, Living In Your Aquarium, Secret History Living In Your Aquarium. I made it real long just so it'd be hard to I corrected somebody the other night just because I want people to say in because it is different and when you're searching to, and oh my god I won't ever do that again but anyway uh, we're glad to have Alex and I'm real excited about this I read a little bit on the topic that he's going to talk about and, uh, that's a, a fish that changed genders and the fluidity of that and our format is Alex is going to go over uh, some general aspects and uh, talk generally about the subject for a little bit. And then uh, he'd like to open it up for questions and your input and discussion. So this may be great. Uh, this may be. Um, oh, yeah. I see. Skipper. Oh, it's Skipper. Yep. Let's see. Hey Skipper, welcome. Hey Skipper. Lakes to the party, I see. Well, yeah, definitely that gets you all the attention. Um, Alex was just going to start, so um, if you'll help watch for questions to uh, in case he misses them for later, we'll get started. Alex? All right. All right. All right, guys. So I'm Alex Williamson, as Bob said. Thanks for having me, Bob. I appreciate it. Um, so I've got a channel, too, if you haven't seen it. But uh, Bob and I have been friends online, and he's been one of my mods for probably – he's the longest standing mod that I have. So, you know, thanks for all the years of service and uh, growing together. So, uh, yeah. But I'm going to talk today about kind of – so we can define the terms and – you know, a lot of people don't know the the proper terms for what we're going to talk about. And so I'm going to kind of discuss some of the terms. But basically what we're talking about is the concept that fish can be born one sex or gender. Uh, and those are different. We'll discuss that slightly. And then they can change and reproduce in various ways. Um, that may not be familiar to our normal birds and the bees talk that you may have recalled for humans. So um, it's kind of interesting in that humans also have a little more gray area than uh, scientifically we may have thought in the past too. So we'll kind of uh, compare to human uh, examples in some ways just to kind of get everything situated in our minds. But um, we're going to kind of go through uh, those things. But to, to start off the topic, basically, as we know it currently, and, and we are aware that we are unaware, we know that there are a lot more fish out there that do this in some form than we currently know of. But what we know of and what has been scientifically studied thus far, 2% of all fish and slightly higher, actually, of freshwater fish are able to uh, change gender or they are born with hermaphroditism, which basically is a differential in the chromosomes and how an animal is genetically uh, lined up for its sex, either male or female, and how it expresses itself uh, with the tissues and organs externally. So, the hermaphroditism is in a, um, say, say you have a, a molly, an Amazon molly. That's a species uh, that is a sort of hermaphrodite, hermaphroditism, expresses hermaphroditism. And it is a species that there are no males left in that species. So in the Amazon molly, which is in the postiliata group, uh, you know, with guppies, sword tails, all the live bears that we know and love. Um, they have, they've figured it out from their chromosomal, um, from their, we can go back and look at the, the, the DNA and 
see variations in changes that occur. And in that chromosomal DNA, we can tell that it was around 240,000 years ago that those fish, that species, all of a sudden, all the males disappeared. Somewhere between that and um, 20, um, with give or take 20,000 years. But the way that we see that is you can go look at the DNA and we can tell every time a, a new individual is born, you get a certain amount of errors. And so we can account for those errors and count how many generations the errors are and then average out how many errors there were. So, you know, that tells us if there were, you know, 20 errors, maybe we know there's five errors every generation on average. So it's probably four generations, you know, if you, if you add it up like that. Um, so going back, they figured that out. Now, the, the, the kind of interesting thing is that humans, we think of as having two gender or two, a lot of people will say two genders, but it's really sexes. So the difference between sex and gender coming from an anthropology and archaeology background, um, that's where I'm formally trained, uh, would be that sex is your genetic and uh, structural um, expression of how you reproduce your, your reproductive organs and chromosomes. Uh, and hermaphroditism is when there's some, it's basically a sliding scale of a differential between the structural and the genetic. And then gender is how you express those things. So in humans, you could say that gender, you know, that, that traditionally a lot of people think of us having two genders, so male and female. But really, we have uh, many genders if you look up different societies. Um, Native American cultures in the Plains, Great Plains societies, they had um, a gender that they called two-spirit, which was either males or females who lived in a role as the other gender. So they would, um, what we say today as, as cross-dressing or whatnot. Well, it's kind of interesting in that fish like cichlids and complex behavior that we see in fish, they can do this too. So a lot of times fish have a gender, we're going to call it a gender, even though gender is much more complex, nuanced in humans. It's, it's a, a society, uh, society shapes it and, and creates it. Uh, as well as the individual. But in fish, um, the group also does Im impact it. So maybe if there's too many males, and for instance, in guppies, here's a great example. Guppies will actually, um, you know, it's around 50-50 male, female, uh, which most species, that's the case. Uh, genetically speaking, the sex is 50-50 male, female. However, only about 40% of the species is expressing as male. So that would be their gender is male. So basically 10% are sexually male, but they look like female. We call those sneaker males as a, as a slang term in the hobby a lot of times, or, or um, you know, sneaker females or whatever. But basically um, they they do this as a strategy. So that's not the same as changing sex, but it is very interesting. And sometimes it goes hand in hand. So they may change their gender and their sex. Uh, so it's kind of a complex subject and it's, it's hard to know sometimes because oftentimes when we think that our fish has changed its sex, it's actually just changed its gender. So the, the guppies, for instance, so many of the males, they have the strategy of grow really fast, be really bright, shiny, pretty, have complex patterns, have lots of red and orange spots on them, which in the wild in Trinidad and Tobago that, and Venezuela where they're found, that shows that they had carotenoids in their diet, which is a key vitamin and nutrient for them. And it shows the females that they're healthy. So when they do their little shimmy dance if you've ever had guppies and they shake uh and they kind of uh flare off their fins and lots of species do this not just guppies obviously but it shows that i have the energy 
to dance all day. I have the energy to pester those female guppies all day um, and to run around the tank and to spar with other males. And uh, also, if it comes down to it, they'll actually, you know, kind of interlock and wrestle with other males. Well, evolutionarily, some of the males have said, I'm not going to play that game. I'm too small. It's not going to work. So if they inherited a gene, perhaps for being smaller and less colorful, they may have the strategy of pretending to be a female. So what they will do is they'll just sit back, not colorful, but they have the full ability to reproduce. And when the other male gets all the females in the mood and they've all beat each other up and expended their energy, then this sneaker male, as we call it, comes in and fertilizes one of the females. And uh, that's a viable uh, reproductive tactic. We've got also cichlids that do things like this, like the cuckoo catfish with the synodonis, where they actually switch species. They sneak in and put their eggs in the nest or in the mouth even for a mouth brooder of another species uh, and then get raised by that. So there's all sorts of incredible evolutionary um, tactics that go on. But let's, let's kind of define the three main things that occur when fish are changing sex and gender. Um, and specifically, we're going to be talking about sex because that's more, um, to me, that's more, uh, it's less debatable because you can debate whether that fish is expressing being uh, more like the females of the species generally, or it's expressing a whole new gender. There can be a third gender, fourth gender, fifth gender. Um, you know, you could say male as female is one gender. You could say female as male is another gender, or in some cultures, in humans, that's one, you know. Uh, so the groupings are kind of trivial and kind of up to human societies when humans do that. But when fish do it, um, you know, scientists note that sometimes, and, and there have been dozens of genders categorized because we have the possibility in fish and in humans of being born with chromosomes on the sex scale. So you could be born with XY or XX. That's what most people think of XX being female and XY being male. Well, you can also be born with XXY or XYY or XXX or XXXY or XXYY. So um, there's all sorts of variations, even in structural, rigid definitions of sex. So um, even though it may be rare, in some species, it's not that rare. And in other species, uh, it's in, in humans, it occurs about 2% of the time to humans to have some sort of uh, what, what we call it is a uh, differential of sex, sexual development. And it just means that whatever your DNA is saying and whatever your organs or outward appearance of your um, gender, uh, your physical gender, I, I don't want to get demonetized for Bob. So basically of your, uh, your, um, your male and female parts, uh, as we call them, uh, slang wise, I guess, if that differentiates from your genetic information. And humans, they go through puberty. And so you could also call pre-puberty another gender almost because they're not, they're not able to reproduce humans before puberty. So yes, they do have a sex, but do they have a gender or is it a different sex? Is it male pre-puberty and male post-puberty? Is it female pre-puberty and post-puberty? Well, with fish, um, basically the same thing can occur. Some fish don't gain the ability to reproduce until a certain age. And in some species, it's hermaphroditic. And that means that their environment or their genetic predisposition, we don't know in, in all cases, but for some reason, they have the ability to actually determine going one way or the other. That is, it's not rigidly fixed that from the time that 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 egg was fertilized and conceived and it was an embryo from the time that that happened it was not predetermined as in humans oftentimes it's predetermined we think um 
There is new science coming out on that, and there are chemicals that can impact this as well. You know, in the fish world, chemicals such as estrogen and testosterone, um, chemicals specifically like birth control in humans, that gets metabolized by women who take it, and then it gets flushed out into the toilet after they use the restroom. And a lot of it is not actually absorbed into the body. It's filtered through the kidneys and then um, excreted in urine. And that goes into the wastewater treatment plants, which then breaks down all the harmful ammonia and things. But estrogen is a chemical that doesn't get broken down. It goes out into the ambient um, ecosystem. And so uh, this has been shown in many cases to cause male populations of fish to develop female traits, if not actually become the sex of female, which then means they can successfully reproduce. They grow ovaries and they actually lose their male gonad tissues. Um, and so we know that this can happen artificially. We know that we can cause it to happen with a number of chemicals. There's also plastics, um, another plastic that's out there causing problems right now uh, where is it? I wrote the name of it because it's real long. Um, ethyl nisyl estradol F17. And then there's about 18 other variants of that, but it's found in plastics. It's a byproduct that happens when you make, uh, things like, um, hard PVCs and, and, and plastics like that. Um, but it's a byproduct that basically stops male hormones from, working on an organism. And so we've seen this in frogs, we've seen it in fish, we've seen it in a lot of different species. Um, and that's a whole other discussion. But the other thing that can have a role is the fish in the environment naturally. So if you live in a dense, say you're a saltwater fish and you live in a reef, or you're a freshwater fish like a killifish and you live in a pond, well, the mangrove killifish of Western Africa they actually have one gender in their species and one sex. And that is, um, you could call, I mean, they have different names for it. And technically it would be a hermaphrodite. But what it is, is it's uh, the, the fish in that species, they just self-reproduce. They, they have a womb and they also have the ability to fertilize their own eggs. And so they don't need a male and female construct of gender. And as far as we know, they branched off in a species before that even existed. So it, it appears as though that species the entire time for over a million years, it's existed and only known the ability of all individuals are kind of the same. They're kind of all male, all female. Whereas that Amazon Molly I was talking about used to have male and female. And at some time there was a uh, metamorphosis or mutation that happened and a female was then able to self fertilize herself um, in a different way. But genetically she still has the X, X, Y, I believe it is um, gender construct. Like her chromosomal DNA says that. Uh, but if we want to go down the list, real quick and then we'll open it up and we'll chat about this but basically there there's sequential hermaphroditism which is when you're born or you live as one gen or one sex and gender probably and then something in the environment or something about um the age maybe it's a food restriction or maybe it's that there's no males left in the colony um uh, then something sparks a change and we're trying to learn right now in science it's cutting edge science to figure out what it is that causes that why why does that occur um and for instance i just did a video on pea puffers and recently uh research was done in the wild and pea puffers were found to be 50 percent male and female well early in the season they found that there were eightfold more females than males in they only studied one river in this study and about 900 individuals. But in the, in the lab, when they studied them on a farm, basically living in tanks in Southeast Asia, and then again in California, they found that um, 
this uh, species of pea puffers um, that they actually were being born as all females uh, on the outside and kind of like we are, they go through a puberty. So it's kind of like they were almost non-sexual, but if you had to call them a certain sex, it would be female. Uh, and then at a certain time in their life, they develop into male and it's early on. Now all fish, unlike mammals and um, birds and uh, well, reptiles are similar actually, but um, all fish can change their gender, sex, whatever you want to call it. They can change that in the actual embryonic phase. And that's not like humans. Humans and mammals don't do that. We're predetermined early on. So then the next type of hermaphroditism is protogynous, which means they're born female for sure genetically. Then they turn into male when there's a stressor. And this is um, usually said to be due to the uh, size advantage hypothesis. And basically it says that uh, male of the species consume more resources. They eat more, they fight more, they're flashier usually. And so there's a, lo a list of species we know really well, uh, parrotfish, groupers, um, blue uh off the coast of florida the blue-headed race um that are born and bass perch uh different species in both groups are born so that they can switch and that they are born female but they become male when it's time to reproduce in small numbers so as to conserve that uh those resources and also so that they aren't constantly fighting and you know killing each other because the males, you know, have the ability in some of those species to actually do damage and kill each other. Um, now, those species also have traditional male and female roles too sometimes. So not all these species are always switching up like this. It's sometimes only because of stressors in the environment. Uh, but oftentimes keeping them in captivity could be considered a stressor and we need to look at that, at what we're doing and what, which species maybe uh, that's occurring with or what it has an impact on. So the next kind is called protoandrous. So we had protogynous, gynous as in, you know, gynecology, same stem word um, there, same suffix that is. And then protoandrous and uh, same root as androgen. And so that means born male sexually and genetically transitioning to female. And we have sebrim, um, cleaner wrasses, uh, barramundi, clownfish, and uh, a whole host of other uh, fish that are born like this. And if they lose one of the pairs, or if they don't even have um, a female present in a colony, then one of the males will color up and become the female. So in the Finding Nemo sense, uh, uh, you know, the story of Finding Nemo, his father would have actually just become his mother is what would have happened um, when he was orphaned or whatever, or when he lost his mother. Um, and then there's the most rare kind and the most interesting kind for science, which is bidirectional uh, hermaphroditism, which means they can switch back and forth and back again. And that is really interesting. And, uh, you know, this is also... Um, this, this is uh, much rarer. It's in coral gobies. Um, we know it's in a few other uh, species of um, spiny eels and then some cyprinids also that it's been documented in. But um, if you go through the entire list, and this is basically where I'm going to leave it because we could keep go on and on and talk about all the different unique situations. But basically... I just find it interesting that 2% of humans are born with a genetic discrepancy between gender and sex in their genetics. And 2% of all species of fish that we know of currently are that way in general. So it's kind of, I don't know, the 2% shows up uh, it, frequently in, in these uh, sexual discussions, which is kind of interesting. Now there's also things like chimerism where, 
one individual has two sets of genes. It's basically like a twin, identical twins were fused together into one individual. So maybe their hair has one genetic um, profile and their saliva is another. Uh, that happens in humans. That happens in plants. That's how we get a lot of times variegated plants that are bright white, you know, striping on half the leaf and green on the other. Um, but it happens in fish a lot of times too. And we see that in, you know, snakes and a lot of the patterns that we like in domesticated things like crebenzis or cichlids that we keep or uh, goldfish or whatever it may be, koi. Um, sometimes it's that where you see one eye, one color, and one another, it can be that. It can also just be that the gene for eye color was uh, switched around. But there's lots of uh, implications of what can happen. And um, to just read off right now, the biggest, uh, these are the groups of fish that for sure have been documented that can either self-replicate or they can change gender to replicate or change sex to replicate. Um, we know that almost all fish can change gender. That is, they can sneak around pretending to be the other sex visually, you know, color wise, size wise, fin shape wise, all those things. That's very, very common. In fact, it's hard to find species where we haven't found incidents of that being documented. But where they can actually reproduce with viable offspring, we have hagfish, sharks, and rays, lizard fish, as in like lizard catfish, and also uh, the lizard fish related to um, uh, like bichers and, and some of the African fish there. Uh, spiny eels, as well as the whole postciliata uh, group, uh, the entire cichlid group, the entire cyprinid group, the entire perch group, and the scorpion fish group uh, all have that ability. So that's just to put that into your head. That's been confirmed. Uh, there's lots of scientific literature out there. Uh, but I'd love to hear what you guys have seen. If you've seen your fish do that, I, I've been speaking with um, biologists at University of Washington and ichthyologists because um, scarlet baddis seem to do this also. The females are extremely hard to find. And when you find one, oftentimes she turns into a male once you get rid of the male in the tank. So the question is, is she, was she always a man? Was he always a male or was there an actual change that occurred? Was it a change like in puberty or was it an environmental change as in cortisol levels went up, which caused androgen blocking or promoting in this case um, chemicals. And then from there, it just, you know, continued. And uh, if a more dominant male comes in, they'll actually color down and from that point on, they don't reproduce as females ever, um, but they're kind of null and void as a reproductive male in the population. So basically, that's where I wanted to leave the talk today as far as going over terms and all that sort of thing. But uh, now I can look at questions and we can talk about that um, or however Bob wants to open up the panel and whatnot, I'm happy to do. Um, let me pull the phone a little closer so I can actually see what folks are saying though. Um, apparently I am having a little bit of Wi-Fi issue, but I can hear you fine. I think it's when I speak that people have trouble. It's not my microphone, uh, Scott. Um, so panel, I'm gonna bring everybody back up and there we go. Um, do you guys have any questions uh, on the panel or in the stream? Uh, did you notice comments? There were a lot of comments. Somebody said they need a drink now, Alex. <laughs> yeah. You know, a, a lot of people, uh, I have to say, take this as some personal affront to their beliefs about sex or yeah. gender. And just, they're fish, guys. Let's try not to do that yeah. right now. Uh, yeah. And this is, I mean, and also this is, I mean, it's proven, so I don't really care how you feel about it. They they show genetically that these fish are reproducing and switching, you know? So in those cases, we can argue about gender, but this reproductive sex issue, is it, it's settled, and, and it's yeah. um, we're just learning more and more about it, really. 
uh, for fish, that is. Well, I so, question. I'm sorry, Skipper. Go ahead. Go ahead. So there, there's one thing I want to bring up is whenever you mentioned about the killy, that one killy fish. Yeah. That, like, in the plant world, we would consider that asexual, right? That it's reproducing yeah. itself. So, there, I think, like, I'm just this one comment that Mike M threw out there that he heard killifish. Oh my God, he's doing scientific names on me. It's considered a, a, her, a hermaphroditus. So, female legs egg, lay eggs develop to fry. Most females ready to coffee their mom. Few are males and never seen spawning. So, when that that killifish, there's like there's a there's cray there's also some crayfish that they call them self cloning. Yes, that, crayfish that, are they, even more complex, and snails right. too. Yeah, right. So that in a way, that type of killifish would be where it's reproducing itself because there ain't it's it's one of them environmental things for the, their species to survive correct right yeah and i mean it's kind of like the whole jurassic park line life will find a way um mm -hmm. when they when they said that you know f like frogs are known to do that amphibians are known to do that um yeah if they're alone long enough if they're the last one in the pond uh, it's it's common for females of various species to all of a sudden become fertile. Or I wouldn't say common, but it does happen, I should say. Um, and just how common it is, that's what science is trying to figure out right now because it's a big open question, um, but but pretty interesting. I was going to start on that comment by Mr. Manifesto that's on the screen. And it was right above the one uh, Skipper was talking about. So I'll jump in a headline and ask you what your opinion is about that. Yeah. Um, so basically, I see the question being, this self-reproduction seems like a genetic bottleneck or at least a stagnation. If species become susceptible to disease, wouldn't that potentially wipe out a whole species? Well, what's interesting about this is that uh, in the case of the Amazon molly, that's the only one that I've really researched that topic on. They've found that because it's still, it, it's not operating with three, or it's not operating with two chromosomes, it has three. So it has XXY in all the females. Uh, I, I believe that's how it works, yeah. Um, they're finding then that that actually allows one of the chromosomes to have a duplicate of information that, that is equal to what the male would pass down. So when the embryo is developing, there's still two or even three copies of any gene that would be on the X chromosome, and there's still um, half the options for the Y chromosome. Whereas, um, you know, sometimes we have disorders that are associated with, like colorblindness tends to be on in males, you know, um, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, or more common in males, I should say. Um, so interestingly enough, that's what the hypothesis was when they went into the research and they found that no, actually there was no bottleneck. They were doing better than their uh, than the other mollies that had two genders, which blew, I mean, that totally blew the lid off of what they were expecting. But that's just in the case of that one fish. I don't know overall. I would have assumed the same thing too, so. Now, I wonder if, like, what you're saying with that, like, I'm sure there's more species out there that have not been been uh, scientifically proven yet, that it sure. comes down into their their location and the environment that they're living in for the survival rate. Yeah. You know, to, you know just to keep, you know, keep going with, you know, their life of well, their, yeah. their species. And um, another thing that kind of ties into this, for instance, is um, a lot of people have talked about, for instance, the postciliata group. And uh, if you have guppies or endlers or mollies or whatever, uh, and you're, you're breeding something that uh, you want more males or females, in general, you can change the temperature and affect that. And that is one of those environmental things, whereas the hotter temperatures will actually cause more females to uh die if i remember correctly 
So you'll end up with more males. You're not actually transferring anybody, but you're reducing the number of females. But in some species, you actually are changing the embryos. So like a high TDS, for instance, uh, total dissolved solids, that may tell the species that, hey, we're a killifish that lives in small mud puddles and ditches, and our eggs we lay um, dry out into mud for six months and then only come back when rain comes. Well, this time it's getting really dry and there's only one female around maybe. So they'll tell them, you know, in the embryo stage, there'll be some chemical signal that'll say, hey, this year's really dry. Um, let's do all females because females can reproduce, you know, you only need one male to, to fertilize all those females. So let's, let's do mostly females. Um, and, and I'm making it sound like evolution has a mind or, or, or biology has a choice. And it's, it's not like that, obviously, but, um, this has been selected for over time. This is what's worked. This is mm -hmm. what's kept it alive. And, and just a little evolution thing while we're talking about that, uh, you know, something to think about is that every, like, if you're listening to this, if you hear this right now, you're watching us, everybody before you successfully got together and reproduced and no one failed at that before dying. And that's why you're here. Mm -hmm. And that's happened billions of times or, or millions of times all the way back to whenever, you know, um, is if you believe in evolution, that is. So, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of a mind blowing thing that every creature took care of its young and or got its young to the point where it could reproduce that many times. And that's why you're here. Uh, I'm a member of the Tennessee Aquarium, and I just I don't really go except to enjoy the aquarium, of course. But they do like talks all the time. And one time I was in there, and they were doing a talk on uh, self cloning fish, and they were mainly talking about the sawfish and mm. sharks, because well, yeah. you know, salt water. And they were saying that uh, the reason, because I know that somebody asked, why aren't they all the sharks? And uh, sorry, the cat's standing up. Uh, Sharks and sawfish female. And they said that they prefer to always mix the DNA and find a male. But when they can't find a male, that's when they're doing the cloning. And uh, I thought that was super uh, interesting, you know, because they want to expand the, the gene pool. But if they can't, sure. then they do it. And I, I thought that was a really neat thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Learn. So, you know, the other interesting thing is that um, the sequential hermaphrodism is when um, it happens in snails and crayfish, and you can literally have it where they'll the male is taken out of the environment, and the individual that's left, which we would call female um, from the outside view, uh, and genetically it's mostly female too. It's it's like XXY usually or XX um with some mutation they can sequentially literally i mean first they they're female so they have ovaries with eggs and they literally can store that in a womb and then within four to five days they develop gonad uh, testes and they fertilize their own womb and then they switch back to female to have the estrogen and life line stuff to to take care of their young um but if you lay eggs you don't really need to take care of them after that point but there's actually some live bearing creatures that that will do that and they'll flip from female to male to female uh and then internally birth you know ha have a live birth um internally so yeah um it's can't it's uh, can't the uh Pea puffers do that as well. I mean, like they can choose what they want to be. Uh, you know, so I, when I put the video out, I got a lot of um, a lot of uh, conflicting info from different people. So I'm not. I have to say, I'm not 100 percent sure. Honestly, I know that it's been documented for sure, and I know that there's papers on both cases of it occurring and also 
in the wild it not occurring and it being 50 50 from you know from birth on but then also they, they've shown that when cortisol levels are high in puffer species um they looked at a few different puffers uh that it, it tended to cause a suppression in the male um hormones or air androgens and testosterone and things like that um and that only one or two of the fish in that colony would actually like bulk up and become the the big male that would be uh of reproductive stature and basically that is kind of um the the thought behind that is that maybe that was the fish that was most robust or most resistant to stress and to the harshness of that environment being so um, densely populated or sparsely populated, whichever way it was, um, that they were then able to withstand that barrage of chemicals. And then once they start changing, they've actually found that they produce uh, chemicals that block uh, testosterone being produced in other males. So they actually have chemical warfare, essentially, uh, to keep away other males so that their little harem of female puffers is theirs. You know, no one else is going to come in and be the male to take them away because they'll literally uh, make them infertile or that male will be that much stronger. And evolutionarily, um, you would say he's more fit and he literally overpowers that male and takes over the group. And so then the other one uh, is overpowered and he turns back into a subdominant male or a female, depending on the research you're reading. That's kind of what they can't agree on when you talk to different people right now. But the, those articles have all come out in the last two years. So, I mean, like I said, a lot of this is brand new information and it really took, um, I mean, human yeah. society, uh, whether you like it or not, you know, we've been talking a lot about um, transgender things, gay, straight, all sorts of different orientations between gender, sex, and then we've known about the, the actual structural genetic um, differences in humans for a long time. I mean, we knew about it more pre-industrial revolution because say you have 200 people, if 2% express some sort of hermaphroditism, then, I mean, within a, a tribal group of a few hundred people or a few tribes, you're probably going to encounter that uh, non-normal, I mean, that, that's probably not the PC way to say it, but that yeah. differential, that sexual um, differential, you're probably going to have seen that. Or if you live on a farm and care for dozens mm -hmm. of animals, you're going to see some that are born halfway between the genders. So we've known about it, uh, but this, this concept of also the behavior correlating with the genetic structure and is that hardwired? Is it environmental? Is it both? Um, that's a, a big question right now. And it gets pretty controversial. But I think it's really fascinating regardless. And I'm just open to see what information they come up with, you know. Alex, yeah, I, uh, uh, Scott has a, raises a point for clarification there. Uh, no matter what, all creatures need another partner, no matter how they flip correctly. Is that true? I cannot see how life would create itself. No, they they don't. Um, signal crayfish, for instance, which are a major problem in in um, California right now in the California waterways. Um, they they are um, able to clone themselves. So they do it through. Uh, I, I believe I might be wrong. Someone may know more about crayfish, obviously, but. Um, the crayfish, I think they actually um, have stem cells that are not um, X or Y chromosome type cells. They have stem cells, which we call non-differentiated sexual cells. And it's like um, an embryo would have. And basically they're waiting for a cue and they'll develop into whatever tissue they get as a cue from their genetics. So they don't really have a gender as it were um, of male or female. They're just told you're going to reproduce um, and have the parts, you know, that, that you lay eggs, but those eggs will fertilize themselves by a different method of 
um, the the genetics when when you have DNA, it's basically two. We have the double helix, and every uh, I guess I can't really do it with one hand, but every pair uh, on the helix on either side, it crosses over and has a match for it. So it's a way that DNA checks to make sure that it's not doing chromosomal errors and things like that. And um, what happens is if that goes wrong twice, you can get Down syndrome. You can get um, different, you know, chromosomally based um, disorders. But some of the quote unquote disorders end up being evolutionarily ad advantageous. And so they stick around. And in the case of crayfish, and a lot of snails, snails in particular, can reproduce. Um, a lot of them can do it with um, both genders on their own or as this kind of one gendered species that, that just basically makes more babies that are genetic identical copies of itself, uh, which is how fungi reproduces also. Fungi, you cannot get, um, I mean, you don't get a baby that's, been pollinated non-flowering plants do this too so life all over the world um has done this for a long time um you know flowers actually are under a uh, hundred million years old so life's been around they they figure 1.4 billion years i think is is what a lot of people kind of say i mean it could be up to three if you count viruses and early um, mm -hmm. bacteria but i mean at least a billion years and only for the last 10% of that, um, but you know, if you had a calendar, only since the end of November of the year has sexual selection been a thing in plants. So pretty interesting. So can I, I wanted to make a comment on what what you just described, and I'm going to put it in my my uh, redneck layman's terms. Okay. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think the issue with with the this just what, what I I think about it is the issue with the whole the whole controversy, right? Is whenever we grow up, we're always taught, you know, the the mammal biology, and whenever they try to teach you about other, like your amphibians, your fish, uh, plants, not not plants, but we'll just use animals as an example, that they they make you think that they all reproduce the same way as humans do. But I think that's where a lot of the controversy comes from because that's what was put into our mind whenever we was younger. And when you start going out and doing your own research, you get involved more with, we'll say, your reptiles and your 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 fish and stuff that you're going to find out that there's more to their genetic makeup than that there is to us. Like, for instance, yeah. you've got a salamander. You've got its tail, it, its tail falls off. It grows another one. They're like, how's that happen? It's just their genetic makeup on on how they survive. Yeah, it's yeah, more complex than a human being, and well, we'll just say mammals in general. Yeah, and I mean, you have to figure that uh, there are more fish species than there are all other animals, other than insects combined. So you combine all the reptiles, amphibians, birds and mammals and there are more known species of fresh and saltwater fish than all those other things combined so there's a lot of chances for variation to occur and those those species that i named off in the list at the end of my little uh monologue i guess you'd call it um those are different groups so that means th that has evolved as a form of reproduction separately in each of those groups um different times throughout history whereas um you know in in mammals um there's a lot less diversity or a lot more have gone extinct either way you want to look at it um and so those options or that genetic now we're learning that genetics you have epigenetics and regular genetics and epigenetics is like puberty you are, are a certain age and something in your in your uh, internal clock tells you make these chemicals and you start changing and you get, mm -hmm. you know, hair, you get all the changes. Everyone knows what puberty does, but there's other changes like that that can occur for fish like, oh, you're living in cold water now, like salmon. 
You know, yeah. oh, you're spawning now. You get the hump. You turn red. You get bulky. Mm -hmm. And your only goal is to get up river. You don't need to worry about anything else. You can have cancer. You can, you know, anything that happens to your body, you don't need to worry about it. Your body doesn't need to worry about its liver and kidney functions because you're going to be gone soon. So they can put yeah. literally their entire metabolism into metamorphosis and getting up river and, and spawning, you know? So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Whereas that's just not our, our reproductive strategy is very rare in the wild, which is taking care of our young for an extremely long time in small numbers, you know? So. Sorry, I didn't mean to take over the panel. I apologize. No, no, that was great. That was great. <laughs> I'd be willing to bet, though, in school they did teach you about animals that don't need it. It's just we didn't pay attention or we've forgotten. Because <laughs> I, I think, you know, everybody heard about how hydras bud and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, different, th you know, asexual things. So it's just I think a lot of us have forgotten because it's just so far in our past. You know, there well, was an it was an interesting time when I went to school because there was a huge argument over whether they were going to teach evolution or whether they had to teach creationism too. And before they used to teach evolution, but for about 5 years right when I was in high school, they decided not to teach either one. <laughs> so oh they God. basically just like kind of skimmed over that and they gave us the birds and bees of humans but they just yeah. didn't touch it on anything else and that was a total disservice in my opinion um you can believe whatever you want but um when there's a lot of scientific research out there uh that people have spent their lives on uh for what it's worth maybe you should read it and then make up your mind after that you know yeah, I could tell you with the whole homeschooling thing right now. I've been dealing with my son's science, and he's in what? Well, he's in sixth grade. Wow. And that's where I was getting to with the, with the plants being asexual, and some have the male and female parts, is it, they they really didn't talk a lot about, about the animal side of it. It's like it feels like in, in nowadays it's almost like, forbidden in schools for them to be talking about it. Yeah, it's kind of a shame. Going on in society. And it is a shame because it, it's good stuff to know in my eyes. Yeah, well, and I mean, to me, um, you could say God made all those things happen if that's what you want to say, mm -hmm. you know. But, um, you know, we won't go into that. I won't, I won't, I won't take over uh, Bob's stream here and, and uh, no, make no. everyone mad. No, no, no. You go what your way. You need to go with it to make points or to. I, I, but I, I, I mean, to I, me, I, we can, what Skipper said. I, I think that we tend to peg things into areas that we can remember and we're more comfortable with. I have the mm -hmm. self cloning crayfish, and I always call them sheep. Always, always. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think that there's things like in the Bible where. I don't mean to dissuade anybody's religion. It's Easter, but um, it says that the that the sun revolves around the earth, and that's just not how we understand the world now. Now, was that somebody wrote down something wrong, or I mean, it looks like that. If you make an observation, what would it look like the other way? You know, if it was the other way, what would it look like? The same thing. So, I mean, it doesn't need to be a battle always in my mind, but I know some people are very verbatim about whatever religion it may be that they believe in. But, um, you know, for the most part, this discussion can't happen in a circle if you're not willing to go with evolution. So, you know, that's just kind of one of the things that if, if you don't believe in it, it, this topic isn't really for you to, to jump in and debate because it's just not going to go anywhere, you know? Right. Yeah. Larry D, uh, he thinks it's very fascinating. He would like to know where you get your information so he could look it up. And, you know, yeah. that's something I'd like to expand on that. You're a super knowledgeable guy. You know lots of stuff on fish. Now, do you just read lots of books? Have you take classes? Do you, you work? Now, you, I know you used to work at the fish store, didn't you? That really yeah. awesome one that had the real neat plants and yeah. everything. Yeah, I worked at Aquarium Zen and, and learned to aquascape there under Steve Waldron, um, who also aquascapes for Amazon uh, corporate. 
But um, w basically getting an archaeology degree is what taught me because archaeology, you have to know geology, biology, anatomy, weather, uh, history, and, and, and social anthropology, as well as material science, like metallurgy or fabric or fiber uh, background, whatever it is you specialize in. I didn't end up specializing in getting a PhD. I just, you know, I didn't do the full PhD. Um, but doing that, you learn a lot of places to find resources. And for instance, Google Scholars is a great place. If you just do a Google search, it's going to show you what people wanted to find and clicked on in the first page. Most people never go past the first search page. It's like 99 point something percent of people don't go to a second page in a Google search. So, I mean, for one, go to the 20th page. Um, and if it's got, you know, sources that are, you think are not someone's vlog that are, you know, out of nowhere, um, maybe take a look there. But. But um, I do have an episode on my channel that, that we talked about in a live stream of how to do research, basically. And um, that might help. And also in my community tab section, I post a lot of my articles. And also for my members, if you're a member, I post when I do an episode, I post my sources now, um, whatever I gathered, if it's not from experience or you know whatever, um, I post those. But, but really, um, you can learn a lot. Um, JSTOR is one you have to subscribe to, uh, but there's other ones where it's it's. I take a look at all the journals. There, there's a, a quarterly journal of ichthyology that's just about fish research, you know. And every mm -hmm. four or every three months, that comes out with a new issue, and there's all sorts of interesting stuff in it. And it's kind of annoying that you have to pay for it, but for me and for doing YouTube basically full time now. It, it's it's worth it, you know, and and for my me being interested in it, it's worth it. But it's it is kind of a shame that sorry. there's a gatekeeper. To, oh, sorry, Bob. I was just gonna say. Last thing is, it, it's it's a shame that there is kind of this gatekeeper mentality to knowledge or this kind of elitism to who gets to access what. And that's part of why I love YouTube and why I, there's a lot of great YouTube channels out there too. Um, but that's part of why I do what I do is because I think that I would like to share whatever it is I learned because it's interesting and I just want to talk to someone about it, but mm -hmm. I'm learning as my viewers are learning too. You know, a lot of times I'm reading the paper that no one in the world, but that researcher knew until, you know, the day it was published a few weeks ago. So, um, yeah. and it may be wrong. It may get disproven in the future, but this is how we understand the world for now. And so um, to me, I like scientifically um, cross-checked and peer reviewed, but um, you know, Wikipedia is not a bad start. Then go to the sources in Wikipedia, then read those, then see what their sources are. And it's pretty dense and boring stuff sometimes, but that's what you got to do to kind of find out if it's, if you think it's true or not a lot of times. Yeah, I agree. But Bob, the next two comments, I, I think are pretty good. That one that I've got up there now, Mr. Man, answer that. Right. I wanted Alex to see that one. That's uh, I, uh Miss, Mr. Manifesto said Christianity accepted the theory of evolution 100% because a perfect God would make a world that could self correct and adapt. It was politics that's changed that. Yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm down with that. Yeah. But I like Mikey M's also. What we humans cannot see in our own eyes, we find hard to believe. Microscopes invented many years ago changed a lot of that. But it sure is hard to see chemical reactions in water or air. And it is. Yeah. It, it, it's, I like, I agree with both of those comments. It makes totally good sense. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. And Tom, that would be awesome. I, I am constantly trying to gather uh, and network with other people who are way smarter than me because I'm just a, a person who gathers other people's hard work. You know, um, I'm not doing this research. I'm making observations of my little fish in all my tanks, but I'm not, you know, I'm not doing the arduous work for my whole career. And so I, I love talking to actual ichthyologists and researchers and things like that. And that's, um, that's another great resource. You know, a lot of local fish clubs, 
or local universities, sometimes they don't want to talk to you, but other times nobody wants to talk to them about the very specific thing that they've researched for 20 years. And they'll talk to you for a week straight about it if, if you're interested. So, I mean, don't be afraid to ask uh, politely, you know, people who are experts on the thing. But and thank you so much, Bob, for having me up here. Um, I, I appreciate it. I know we're tight on time, so. That's okay. Kenny wouldn't mind if we go over a couple of minutes, and we are, I think. That's okay. okay. He's a nice, you know Kenny, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's in here, so um, he'll be, we'll be going. And if somebody can post a link to Kenny's uh, chat, that would be awesome, and we can head over there from here. But I was just going to say quickly that one reason that I stayed with Alex, the main reason, I'll be honest, as a mod and as uh, a member um, and always go back to the channel no matter how busy I get or how many people I'm subscribed to is uh, he, he doesn't have the time to do it so much now and in so much depth but he made the point in a live stream a couple weeks ago that he has um, some of his early videos uh, when he was a small channel, and he was at one time, uh, I can attest he was, but some of those videos, all those videos back then, uh, go back to the start and look at those. He put tons and tons of research like he's talking about into those, and they're like reading a favorite book. I mean, if you're looking for knowledge and, you know, why this happened, that's where the name came from, the secret history in your aquarium. I think I got it right there. Yeah, time. you got it. Well, thank you. That's very nice of you to say. And I'm trying to do that again still, but now it's a balance of trying to troubleshoot for members, you know, who are new to the hobby also. And also, you know, my goal is if I can get one every two weeks, that's a good nerdy deep dive. I feel like it, at least I'm chugging along. Uh, that's and then, awesome. you know, you know, that's kind of the goal. When he says deep dive, you just heard him speak for 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> <It's a deep laughs> That's yeah. That's what I mean. Like we come back fish nerd again. stuff. Well, I have you under pressure. We come back another time. I believe oh, Bobby's yeah. backstage. Who? Oh. Bobby's backstage. Oh, okay. I didn't realize he went down. Um, that's why you can wave and say bye. Let's get him in here. Well, thanks again for having me, and also for the support over the years, Bob. I really do appreciate it. And uh, watching all the fish you keep and how that's grown and you get into salt water and all that stuff too, um, that's been just crazy to watch how much you juggle with all your animals. It's amazing. It's it's yeah. a lot of love and a lot of dedication. I'm almost there. Though. Thank you. I appreciate it. Pre appreciate it much. Thank you, Alex. Formally, thank you. And it was great. I knew it would be. And uh, definitely would love to have you back another time and soon. Um, oh, sure. yeah. We might want to try to do like a special uh, time or something to go longer, unless you prefer to stick with this. I can, I'll talk to you about that. So, and the panel, yeah, can I, you guys, sorry. Oh, can I say one thing to you real quick uh, before we go? Uh, so on Tuesday at four o'clock this coming next this this next Tuesday in a few days, uh, Rachel O'Leary will be on my channel. So that should be another fairly nerdy fish talk if you like this kind of stuff we're going to talk about the hobby changing from uh pre-internet to post-internet and what that meant for um species diversity and you know prices and all sorts of stuff so it should be fun but but i just thought i'd plug myself shamelessly there for a minute and no, uh, I'm glad other than did. that i'm done <laughs> i'm glad you did There's another one that i followed and I actually still have fish of hers here uh, Chopra Daniels, oh, cool. I can think of right away, but a little teaser to that, you know, she wasn't convinced that YouTube was for her, and uh, another big YouTuber talked her, kind of talked her into that and supported her through that, so I'm sure she'll bring that up, so, all right, thanks everybody, thanks everybody for awesome questions, and uh, we'll go ahead and end it, and did we get a link for Kenny, for Danica? No. There? I couldn't do it because my computer's acting up, so I got to do chat with the phone. I'm afraid to do it because I will hit the buttons. Damn that. <laughs> I'll hit the buttons. I'll do the wrong buttons and we'll all be dead in the water. All right. Thank you, guys, and thanks, everybody, Thank for being here. And um, 
We'll see you next time. Thanks, Alex. All right. Take care. I'll see you guys in the chat.